Okay, so we're back for part two. Sorry, let me just get that up there. Um, complications that typically affect first stage of labor. I'm including post dates under this category, although it's not specific to um, first stage. And then we're going to discuss tachycystole, um, dystocia, cord prolapse. Eclampsia can really happen at any time um, throughout pregnancy, labor, delivery, and even postpartum. But I'm including it under this because um, typically you'll see it um, in labor when the body's under stress. So post dates pregnancy. This is labor at risk because there hasn't been any labor and mom is still pregnant at 42 weeks. So technically, post-term pregnancy exceeds 42 weeks. However, you almost never see it. And the reason for that is that it's too risky and most providers will induce somewhere in 41 weeks. Um, firstly, babies keep growing and they get big. They get too big to fit through the vagina. Um, and then the placenta gets old and it starts to die. If you're in labor and delivery and you get the chance to see a placenta um, from a post dates pregnancy or from a pregnancy that's been under stress, you might see calcifications. Those are areas where the placenta calcifies, it gets hard. Um, and then you might see little areas called infarcts. Um, and that means tissue death. So when the placenta gets old and it starts to die, the baby can die too because it doesn't have any supply of nutrients or oxygen. So the cure for a post dates pregnancy is, well, first of all, we're gonna surveil the pregnancy after 40 weeks. Mom is gonna get non-stress tests to make sure that that baby still has oxygenation. She still, we still want to see those two accelerations of at least 15 beats per minute for at least 15 seconds in a 20 minute period. If the NST is not reactive, we're going to go for that whole biophysical profile. If you remember from the prenatal lecture, that's when we look at five different categories of fetal well-being, give them score from zero or two, no halfway. I don't know why they even decided to do that. But if it's six, that's equivocal. We should monitor. But if it's post-dates, you really should induce. You have nothing to gain from keeping mom pregnant at this point and everything to lose. So if the, NS, if the BPP is not reassuring and the NST is not reactive, and especially if the baby stops moving as much, we should consider delivery of that baby. Um, an induction of labor at 41 weeks, 41 weeks and some days is okay too, um, is usually the answer to this. Um, in high-risk pregnancies, we don't even usually go to 40 weeks, but uh, this is for a pregnancy that hasn't been complicated. At 40 weeks, we start to watch, we start to get suspicious. Um, and so we deliver that baby. Next topic is tachycystole and dystocia. Um, dystocia means difficult labor. The DYS is difficult. The TOC means contractions. So something isn't working. So tachycystole um, will kind of cover that topic, but means too many contractions. Um, the work is happening too fast, so the uterus is contracting too fast. Um, so let's get into tachycystole first, and it's fairly common. On um, the definition of tachycystole, according to the NICHD, McConus um, and the other authors were the ones that wrote the article um, that became famous, more than six uterine contractions in a 10-minute period averaged over 30-minute window. And I want you to take a look at the picture. Um, I'll get the pointer out. Not that it's all that helpful, but take a look at this bottom. That's your uterine activity. Okay, and you see these contractions are happening within about a minute of each other. They're lasting maybe 80 seconds. Yeah, I think some of them are 90. Um, and there's almost no resting period in between. And that's important to note because rest, um, the resting phase between contractions is where the gas exchange mostly happens. Um, and so tachycystole doesn't allow for a really good gas exchange. And typically what you'll see is baby will tolerate it for a little bit, um, but then it starts to look like this. It, it goes from category one to category two. And then, it, you know, if we leave it and we don't try and fix it, um, we can get ourselves into a category three strip pretty quickly. Um, so there are some related concepts to tachycystole. Um, there are tetanic contractions, and these are really, really long ones. Um, they last more than 120 seconds. Sometimes in early labor, you'll see like one or two really tetanic contractions, and then mom will go 10 minutes without another one. 
Um, but if we're getting a lot of these long contractions, that's a long time for the intervillous spaces to be compressed and for gas exchange to be compared, impaired. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll do something to intervene in that case. And then we have the concept of resting tone. So what is the uterus doing? What does it feel like? How much pressure is there when the uterus is not contracting? So if we have an increased tone, the uterus is still fairly compressed in between contractions. There isn't um, enough blood throw, blood flow, sorry, through those spiral arteries. Um, there's not enough gas exchange taking place and the baby's going to get stressed eventually. They'll tolerate a little stress, but eventually you'll start to see the baby decompensate on the monitor. Um, and that's, you know, if we let that progress and we don't try and fix it, um, we're going to end up with a baby who's acidotic. So some causes and risk factors of tachycystole. Um, it's most commonly associated as a complication of either cervical ripening. Sometimes people will hyperstem on a cervidil or prepidil or mesoprostol, um, even though it's not supposed to make them contract and it's just supposed to soften the uterus. Mom also puts out some endogenous oxytocin. And so when her cervix gets ripe, sometimes those prostaglandins trigger um, a tachycystole pattern. If that happens, we're going to not give any more mesoprostol if that's our agent, and we're going to take out our cervidil if it's still in. That's why it has that nifty string. Um, so we can pull it out if we have to. Um, and we're going to do some measures. And then oxytocin induction, obviously, if we're trying to get mom to contract, people are very individual in their response to oxytocin. Some people could be on 20 milliunits of pit every minute and barely contracting enough to cause cervical change. Other people, you give them just a, what we call whiff of pit um, and they hyperstimulate. Um, so it is a common complication of oxytocin induction and we're gonna address it at that cause if that's what we need to do. Sometimes um, tachycystole happens because of endogenous causes some moms will um, engage in nipple stimulation or sexual intercourse to try and bring labor on, or sometimes that's just part of you know, what's going on at home. Um, and the release of oxytocin during those things and the release of prostaglandin um, during those activities can trigger a tachycystole pattern. If that happens, you discontinue um, nipple stimulation, obviously. Um, and also any con uh, condition that's going to increase the contractility of the uterus, abruption of the placenta and uterine rupture. And those things are addressed under separate topics. And, um, you know, there's an emergent resolution of the underlying cause. But generally the intervention is going to be to stop doing whatever it is you're doing that makes mom contract so much. So pull your cervidil if you have it. Discontinue the oxytocin um, if that's infusing. Um, oxytocin has a really short half-life, and I don't usually care that much about the half-life of drugs um, very specifically, but in this case, it's good to know that it has a short half-life. It starts working fast, and it shuts off pretty fast. You'll start seeing a response within, you know, several minutes. Within 10 minutes, I would say, you'll start seeing a response if you shut off your oxytocin. You're going to give a fluid bolus of at least 500 milliliters of something like lactate ringers or normal saline, whatever the flavor of choice is at your institution. But that fluid bolus is going to um, decrease the concentration of oxytocin in the blood and it will help the uterus relax. Um, it'll also get more blood flow to the baby and that's important as well. Um, terbutaline or brethine as is known is a tocolytic. Toco means contractions and lytic means it stops them. Um, and so you're going to give terbutaline. The instance that you would not give terbutaline um, would be any time when mom is tachycardic, baby's tachycardic. If there's any respiratory issues um, or cardiac issues, you're going to give with caution because it will, um, it can increase blood pressure, heart rate um, for mom and baby, um, and it can increase the risk of pulmonary edema. Um, so those would be situations where you don't give it. When you are giving it, what you're giving is 0.25 milligrams, which equates to 0.25 milliliters in standard dosing um, via subcutaneous injection. Um, and it should start to work pretty rapidly. Now, if your root cause is a placental abruption or uterine rupture, the cure is gonna be surgical. You're gonna get the baby out um, and you're gonna stop the bleeding and that's what's gonna stop your tachycystole eventually. 
Okay, and then we have on the opposite, we have hypotonic labor or end dysfunctional labor. So hypotonic labor is just what it sounds like. The contractions aren't strong enough or frequent enough to cause cervical change. Obesity is a risk factor for this because um, excess body fat makes the body less responsive to oxytocin. Um, sometimes prolonged labor will end up in a hypotonic pattern because the uterus gets tired or it gets oversaturated with oxytocin. There are receptors on the uterus that respond to pitocin. And when we oversaturate those, we have excessive exposure. I used to see this a lot when people were making up their own PIT protocols and they thought more was better. Um, you know, start at four, increase by two every 15 minutes. And it didn't work any faster. You'd have people on 40 million units of PIT every minute and they weren't doing anything. Um, so one sign of this um, is coupling. And I'll show you a picture of that in class. They look like camelback, um, like a double humped contraction and they're really long. And it just means that the uterus isn't responding in a normal way. And there usually aren't effective enough contractions to cause cervical change. Generally, when you see coupling, then you'll get like a long space, like five, eight minutes. Um, and it's a dysfunctional labor pattern. So then we have dysfunctional labor when we have frequent painful contractions. Um, but the muscle fibers don't coordinate to push down on that um, uterus and open up the cervix. A lot of times this can be caused by stress or by prolonged labor because we have a buildup of lactic acid. Those catecholamines that are uh, secreted by mom when she's stressed and in pain sometimes will lead to a dysfunctional labor pattern. Um, so those, that's what those concepts are about. Um, so interventions for dysfunctional labor. Well, we can use labor augmentation methods like if mom has not been on oxytocin, we can start oxytocin. Let's say she's been laboring on her own, but she's not getting anywhere. The contractions are weak, they're far apart. We can start oxytocin, make them stronger, longer, and closer together. Um, we can rupture membranes and the release of prost prostaglandin should bring on contractions that are stronger, more frequent, and longer lasting as well. Um, if what we're seeing is mom's contracting enough, but she's not getting anywhere and she's very tense, um, she's not relaxing, she's not coping well with the pain. And we think that the psyche is the factor that's interfering with a functional labor pattern. We can provide labor support and pain management. Um, try to get mom to relax. Sometimes an epidural is the best medicine for dysfunctional labor. Um, the research really has not supported that epidurals prolong labor. Um, they can prolong second stage sometimes in my experience. Um, but first stage, the dilation of the cervix, typically an epidural doesn't really have that much of an effect on that um, unless it's to relax the mom and actually can make things go a little bit faster. Um, I'm going to introduce the concept of pit rest. I won't test on it. It's really not, um, it's more of an advanced concept when you're a labor and delivery nurse. When you've exposed that uterus um, to a lot of oxytocin for a long period of time, it just stops responding. The receptors are saturated. The best thing you can do sometimes, instead of calling it a day and going back for a C-section, just shut it off for a few hours, give a fluid bolus, let mom rest, and then start it up again. And usually at that point, the uterus will respond. And I had some very successful um, vaginal deliveries that could have ended up a C-section by suggesting to the provider that maybe we should just shut the pit off for a little bit. And I've also had deliveries where the provider did not want to shut off the pit, wanted to keep it going. Um, and we ended up pushing for four and a half hours and, and going back for a C-section. Um, so pit rest could be a tool in your little kit um, if you do be, decide to become a labor nurse and you're in that situation. Um, we can use pit position changes, movement, gravity, the jacuzzi, all of those things to stimulate a dysfunctional labor. Um, one trick if you're in the jacuzzi sometimes is to let the jets bubble um, at the nipple line, so mom gets a little nipple stim, just watch. It's best if you can monitor mom in the tub when you're doing that. Um, but the relaxation combined with the stimulation from the jets, a lot of times will get your labor started again. Okay, and now we have another um, emergency that can happen in first stage of labor. And this is one of those things that if you say cord prolapse, almost every nurse has a very dramatic story um, and if you ever want to see a team of people mobilize, even when they don't even like each other, um, 
you'll see it with a chord prolapse. So what it is, the cord escapes before the presenting part. So let's say baby's floating in the uterus very nicely, and then there's a rupture of membranes. Maybe it's spontaneous, maybe it's artificial and ill-advised. Um, but now the baby's lifeline is coming out through the cervix into the vagina, maybe out of the vagina, and the head of the baby or the presenting part, whatever it may be, is pressing down on it and cutting off all of the circulation. Um, this is a life-threatening emergency for baby. You have minutes. Um, this is not a situation where you want to hesitate or not know what to do. Um, so risk factors for this, premature rupture of the membranes, um, or any, you know, amniotomy when the baby is not engaged in the pelvis. You've got room for the cord to slip through. Um, you know, so this is something you should watch out for whenever membranes are ruptured. Um, the nurse does not artificially rupture membranes. She may assist by handing the provider the hook or the amnicot, whatever they're using. Um, but it is your job to monitor the baby's response after and to be aware that this could happen. Um, sometimes we don't know why the cord prolapses. It can happen the mom's been ruptured for six or seven hours, and then all of a sudden we start seeing some changes on the strip. We go in, the loop of the cord is hanging out of the vagina, and you know now we've got an emergency. Sometimes the uh, cord prolapse is occult, and we can't see it, but usually on exam you can find it. Um, so signs of cord prolapse. Usually the strip will show variable or prolonged decelerations, um, and these are usually deep because you're cutting off circulation. Sometimes you'll see like the variables with the contraction as a baby's head presses down with the contraction. Um, you see that drop, that abrupt drop um, when the cord is compressed and then it kind of lets up and you see a recovery to baseline. Or you might just see a prolonged deceleration. It goes down and it stays down. Um, so when you see that, be suspicious. You might see a loop of cord outside the vagina. You lift the sheet to see what's going on because maybe now you're going to check mom and see what's happening um, and you see a loop of cord. Or you do a vag exam to see what's going on because sometimes those deep decelerations mean that baby's coming, that there's been a change in altitude. Um, so we do a vaginal exam and oops, we feel a cord. Um, if you don't know what a cord feels like, I will demonstrate in class. It's kind of squishy. It will be pulsating. Um, it will feel like a rope, kind of. Um, it might feel loopy. It might even be kinked. Um, it will not feel like a head or a butt. It will feel definitely like something that shouldn't be there. Um, or maybe the mother states, I felt something come out of me and it wasn't a baby um, and it wasn't fluid. So you, you know, that you would investigate and you would probably find your cord then. Okay, so interventions. The first thing you're going to do is yell for help while keeping the presenting part off the cord. So your hands in the vagina, sterile gloves, you know, hopefully, um, and you're applying pressure to the head off of the cord. Usually the head is the presenting part in that case. It could be a breach, but usually it's a head. And you're going to yell you don't have time for lengthy S bar here. It's cord prolapse and in room 12, people need to know where you are to know where to go. Um, do not let go of that presenting part. Keep your hands applying pressure to that presenting part until that baby is out. And it's gonna come out via the abdominal way, um, what we call the vaginal bypass or cesarean section, because it's not gonna come out through the cord. Um, you are not going to manipulate this cord in any way. You're not pushing it back in. You're not moving it. You are just holding the head off of it. That's all. The more you manipulate it, the greater the chances that you'll end up in a vasospasm. Um, and if that happens, even if you have the presenting part off of it, you're not going to get good blood flow. You're going to impair circulation of the baby. If you have time and the cord is protruding, somebody can get you some moist and sterile saline on some sterile gauze and keep it wet because if the Wharton's jelly dries, um, it'll constrict, again, cutting off blood flow. Mom's position here is important. Now, if, if you're moving to the back really quickly, mom's got an epidural, she's not moving very easily, Trendelenburg is your best bet. And most labor beds have a really quick button for Trendelenburg. You push it and try and, you know, keep mom's hips elevated um, so that that baby kind of goes backwards instead of pressing down on the cord. 
Um, if you can get mom and knees to chest, great. That's what the literature supports. Um, but if your hand's already in the vagina and she's got an epidural and it's really tough to um, reposition her, don't waste time. Just get to the back to the OR and do that, uh, you know, and they're going to do a cesarean. So typically what it looks like is you're, if you're the discoverer and your hands in the vagina, your hands have to stay in the vagina until the baby's out. Um, so they're going to cover you and mom's naughty bits with a sheet and you're going to take a ride really, really fast down the hall. It's not uncommon when this happens to hear we're losing so-and-so, you know, Tana's falling off the bed. Be careful. Um, but that's what happens. And you stay and, you know, typically if we can get that kid out really, really fast, um, there's a good outcome. A lot of them end on good outcomes as long as we all know what to do and we can all mobilize our team and our room very quickly. Um, I know that when we talked about cesarean section, I emphasized the importance of the count, but this might be one circumstance where you're willing to tolerate giving mom an x-ray after. If there's time to count, you do. If there's not, you just cut. Um, anyway, a lot of times it's done under general anesthesia um, because that's the quickest method of induction. You don't want to waste time sitting up for a spinal. If mom already has an epidural and it's working, they might bolus it. Um, but that's cord prolabs. And now we're moving on to eclampsia. Um, when preeclampsia quits fooling around, it becomes a seizure event. It can actually happen anytime after preeclampsia is established. It could be at 24 weeks in pregnancy. It could be postpartum four weeks later. It can occur without much warning and sometimes preceded by feeling of impending doom. It's usually also preceded by those signs and symptoms of worsening preeclampsia. Those brisk DTRs, the headaches, uh, spots in front of your eyes, double vision, um, floaters, um, epigastric pain, nausea and vomiting, um, any of those things that uh, occur with worsening preeclampsia. Typically the headache is the big telltale sign because you've got cerebral edema and you've got CNS irritability. Um, so mom progresses to a seizure. We've tried to prevent it, but it didn't happen. Um, so make sure your side rails are up and it's better if you had them padded. That's forward thinking. If you've got preeclampsia, expect eclampsia and hope it doesn't happen, but have side rails padded. Um, do not shove anything in the patient's mouth. No tongue blades. Don't try and get an oral airway in. Don't try to suction them in the middle of a seizure. Don't put anything in their mouth. You'll hurt them. You'll hurt yourself. Just don't do it. But you should have suction and oxygen available. Um, when the mom stops seizing, you'll want to take a yank hour and suction out any vomit that's in the mouth so that she doesn't aspirate on it. You'll want to give her oxygen for her and for the baby. Um, if you can move mom into a side-lying position, what's called the recovery position, that's preferable. Um, if you can do that without hurting her or yourself. If trying to do that might mean that she falls off the bed, then put your side rails up first. Um, you're going to monitor fetal hearts. If you can get them during the seizure, great. Um, if you can't, then definitely get them as soon as it's over. And you're going to look for any signs and symptoms of abruption, that tachycystole pattern or that dark red vaginal bleeding, um, severe pain, um, strong tetonic contractions, um, and of course the non-reassuring fetal heart tones. Because abruption is a risk with a clamptic seizure. You have these violent myoclonic convulsions, um, and sometimes it's enough to cause the placenta to detach. Um, between that and the vasospasm that occurs with preeclampsia, um, you're sort of a setup for disaster. And then usually if mom is still pregnant at this point, we're going to deliver. There is nothing to be gained from prolonging this pregnancy. If she's like crowning, you could try for a vaginal delivery, but generally speaking, it's going to be a cesarean. Um, and then we're also at the same time that we're doing all of this, somebody should be preparing magnesium. So if you're the leader in this case, um, you should be with the patient. Never, never, never leave the patient. Call for help. Seizure in room 12. Um, you know, had, tell someone, point to someone, say their name and say, can you make sure there's working suction and oxygen available? Um, point to someone else and say, I need you to help me get fetal hearts while you're maybe raising the side rail or moving mom to the side. Um, and then of course, you know, somebody, you know, needs to be notifying all of the people that need to mobilize for a cesarean section, the provider. So you point to someone and say, I need you to call 
um, a, for an emergency cesarean. Um, and every place should have a protocol for mobilizing staff in that event. Um, and then you can point to someone else. We need MAG on board. Somebody go get MAG. If MAG's not already running. If, it, uh, if you're already infusing it, say, two grams an hour, you're going to get orders from the provider for bolus, and you're going to turn that bolus on. Okay, so that's it for part two, and that was probably the lengthiest part of it. Um, so stay tuned for more, and this would be complications.